Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And we are rereading our favourite series of novels, the Aubrey Matra novels of the author Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we are in the midst of the Commodore. Remind us, would you, where we were last week? Tell us a little bit about what's coming up this week. Oh, I'd be delighted, Ian. So last week in Chapter 3, the Commodore received his rear admiral's uniform yeah, as head of the squadron here with a post captain under him. Mrs. Williams mm-hmm. received a stern warning by Stephen not to visit Barham Down. Stephen heard Bridget speak in Irish, and she made eye contact with him when he addressed Padine in that same language, which was, of course, warmed his heart. However, he could not find Diana. We were introduced to the ships of the squadron. Uh, Unfortunately, over the course of the chapter, they kept changing often and losing strength. Jack was very jealous of Mr. Hinksy, and Sophie felt that Jack was reserved and distant. And Stephen demanded a new sick berth in the Bologna. And this time in Chapter 4, we have the captain's dinner with all of Jack's command, all the officers serving under him. We hear a bit more particularly about Captain Thomas, and things turn deadly dangerous for Stephen. And we have a review of the book that we've been reading and talking about recently, Trafalgar, Fog of War, by our guest Paul Bryars, also known in his pseudonym for this series of books as Seth Hunter. Fantastic. Really looking forward to sharing our thoughts on the book with you. But here we are right now at the beginning of Chapter 4 of The Commodore. And Mike... It, it it wouldn't be the early stages of a Patrick O'Brien book without a dinner, and it wouldn't be a dinner without Killick. And I, since we're ashore, Killick is fighting for status and fighting for supremacy and moral authority here with the domestic servants. And I, I love this little interaction that we get. Sophie is trying to take control of all of this, but control seems to be a little bit hard to grasp because... She's got Killick right there, cursing Mason, her hereditary butler, who's coming here from Woolcombe. He's often brought over to help with the kind of entertaining that goes along with you know, civilian dinners, this kind of polished civilian dining. Killick has got this butler, Mason, trapped in a corner, threatening him with a fish slice, threatening him for touching what he calls my silver. He shifted three spoons with his great greasy thumbs, says Killick, and I've seen him her on this here slice. I'm, I'm like, I, I, I love the idea of <laughs> Killick and, and the defense from the butler who says, I was only giving it the butler's rub straight away. Ah, we've got the land of at sea and the land of ashore competing with each other. The, the, the butler's name is an oddity as well. And Mike, you, you and I spent a bit of time going back over the spelling. In some editions, including the older ones and the Norton ones in the US, as far as we can tell, this guy's name is spelled in the old, the extinct way of spelling the surname Mason, M-N-A-S-O-N. And in the current HarperCollins UK edition, like the ones that I've got on my Kindle right now, someone has corrected the spelling to the modern spelling of Mason, M-A-S-O-N. And I can't imagine it's a typo. I, I guess that this must have been an O'Brien deliberate use of an archaic spelling. It appears in the same way through this book and also through the Yellow Admiral that we've yet to get to. And Mike, when we look into this, there are some other references to Mason with an N that suggest that this was a deliberate thing from Patrick O'Brien, right? Oh, yeah. A Google engram bounces up a peak at 1807, 1808, and then another peak in the 1820s, you know, slightly smaller peak there. And we've got this same spelling in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and it's in Acts of the Apostles of the New Testament. So a very period-specific name. We just love that. Oh, it's great. (laughs) Well, whatever he's called, he's clearly found himself at the heart of this this argument that Sophie is now trying to referee. O'Brien gives us all this lovely visual language. He gives us color and the, the color of Mason's coat and the visuals of Killick standing behind the Commodore trying to take control of all of this. And the domestic servants like Mason and the seamen, the sailors are eyeing each other up with suspicion. They Sailors don't like Mason because he doesn't do a proper job of cleaning, they think. He doesn't turn the place out every day like they do. He, they're seeing him as a bit as a bit of feet and shore going. 
And meanwhile, Sophie is trying to convey to all of them the orders about who's going to stand where, how the Commodore is going to be seated. A little hint as well of what's to come, as all of this seems to be coming under control with the punctual naval guests due to arrive shortly, Sophie puts all the arrangements to bed and runs off to put on what O'Brien describes as a glorious dress made from scarlet silk, Jack's present, that had survived its almost intolerably arduous journey from Batavia unharmed. And Mike, hmm, stick a pin in the symbolism and the importance of the scarlet dress. We're going to be coming back to that, I have a feeling. Yeah, I think you're probably right, Ian. Absolutely yeah. true. I love, Ian, as you say, this you know this combination of land and sea here. We've even got Sophie with the famous line, there's not a moment to lose. So right. <laughs> it's great. You, you know, we know Ashgrove has definitely gone nautical here with a hint yeah. of Wilkham. Uh, well, that nautical continues to enhance itself as the captains arrive. We've got Duff of the Stately. He's described as tall, athletic, exceptionally good looking, about 35. Sounds just like me about three decades ago, five decades ago. <laughs> I don't know. A long time. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, not, not none of the above. Tom Pullings, Howard of the Aurora. Thomas, the text says, of the unwelcome Thames, and Fitton of the nimble. Sophie whispers to Killick, and Killick runs off to find the doctor. So the guests are all here, Dr. Blissing. We've seen this before. Jack had moved his dinner hours to those of an admiral. We talked last chapter about, you know, with the squadron, he's now got kind of a rear admiral's uh, designation while he's got the squadron. So he along with all the other captains are like, they're completely starving because they're used to eating earlier and they uh, move as they're, they're waiting for the dinner to start from sharp set to ravenous, to yawning and <laughs> gaping. <laughs> very large, very difficult. Gaping with hunger here. And Sophie is making anxious conversation. She's handing out little olives and uh, little biscuits. Well, actually, she's having directing the white gloved blue jackets. <laughs> we, we care to do that, along with some Madeira, uh, a little Plymouth gin, a little sherry. And, you know, we hear that the conversation is becoming pretty forced when the door opens and Stephen, as O'Brien writes, made a curiously abrupt entrance as though propelled from behind <laughs> of course we can just see the <laughs> stiff arm of killick shoving yeah. him through the door here in our minds uh stephen bows to everyone and apologizes to sophie and says he had been contemplating on worry angles and had overlooked the time so ian you had asked us to stick a pin in that scarlet dress worry angles is that also telling us something yeah, it turns out that a worry angle is another name for a shrike. And we talked about shrikes in the last chapter. So scarlet silk, shrikes, and their polyamorous habits with regard to their mates. There's lots of symbolism building up here. And we might have to just wait around for a chapter or two and see what it all might hold for us. Well, like we said, Mike, Sophie is trying to take charge of the social arrangements here. She's got the mostly naval guests seated in civilian style rather than by rank, which would be the Navy custom. The exception here is that Duff, senior captain, is on Jack's right, and Michael Fitton, who is described as the son of a former shipmate and close friend, on Jack's left. Sophie has put two of the more shy guests next to her, which is a very nice, generous thing for her to do. That's Tom Pullings and Carlo of the Orestes. Stephen's seating partner is Captain Duff, who had been talking eagerly to Jack about Bentink shrouds, We'll come back to those in a second. Duff on his one side and Captain Thomas to his right. And thinking about Captain Duff here, Stephen notes that he can't see any sign of the tastes that Jack had attributed to Duff. And tastes is, a, is one way that Stephen is describing uh, the sexual orientation of Captain Duff. We think that he might be gay. He would swear, so Stephen is thinking, that Duff would be attracted to women. But he thinks that might have been said also about Achilles. And he thinks then, in this little mental digression that he often has, about how different cultures treat homosexuality. The comparatively tra straightforward Mediterranean approach that Stephen thinks of. The curious molly shops around the Inns of Court. Molly shops are meeting places for homosexual men. And the sense of furtive guilt and obsession that seemed to increase with every five or 10 degrees of northern latitude. So I, I think a little bit of kind prejudice here on the part of Stephen towards 
the Northern European to ECs is a bit, a bit less enlightened uh, about same-sex relationships. Anyhow, so some nice things for us to dig into here. Michael Fitton is a character that we've met before, Mike. We met him aboard the Nimble. We talked about the real Michael Fitton way back in 13 Gun Salute, Chapter 4. Michael's father, John Fitton, had died standing next to Jack at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. So a nice little bit of O'Brien continuity for us there. And Bentinck Shrouds. Now, my, my, you and I have both read a lot about Bentinck Shrouds in the, in the follow-up to this, and none of us is any the wiser. May I go ahead and read out what it says in an article on historic ship models by Wolfram Montfeld in 2005? This, this is going to clear it all right up for you. Bentinck Shrouds are additional shrouds for lower masts, uh, named after their inventor, Captain William Bentinck of the Royal Navy, were introduced in the latter part of the 18th century, normally only rigged in very heavy weather. And let's get the physical side of Bentinck Shrouds lined up here. Now, four or six short ropes with eyes spliced in one end were seized round the futtock stave and shrouds close up to the cat harpins and led down through the shrouds where they were spliced into a common ring or seized to a thimble. In large ships, the Bentinck Shroud was also spliced into this ring and led to a ring bolt in the opposite waterway where it was set up with a tackle. Small ships occasionally had the rings from both sides joined by a short span from a single Bentinck Shroud led to the foot of the mast set up in the same way. And there you go, Mike. We're, we're all completely cleared up now, right? So no, <laughs> I, no doubt at all about what a Bentinck Shroud is. Well, with, with all of that to to kind of go through, Mike, I know you, you, you dug through the internet looking for pictures. And here's a nice little lubber's hole coincidence. There's an example listed on modelshipworld.com. And we're going to post a link to this thread on modelshipworld.com, where some of the great craftsmen who are trying to build replicas of these ships are talking to each other about how we set up Bentinck shrouds in the model of, uh, I think it was a sloop or a frigate. And I want to give a bit of a shout out then to the forum members on modelshipworld.com, because some of you guys started to share with each other the existence of the Lover's Hole way back in 2020 when we first started. And we've never yet got around to saying thank you to you all for noticing the podcast and for giving us a mention. So thank you for that. Lots of love and best wishes to the folks on modelshipworld.com, wherever you may be. And uh, we'll share that picture of a Bentink Shroud so that we can all have the mist of uncertainty lifted from us when it comes to Bentinck Shrouds. Thanks. Yeah, I, I've, you know, I was absolutely at a loss. And it warmed my heart to see that one of the pictures they used was the USS Constitution, the oldest ship oh. in the U.S. Navy. So, so, so God bless, bless your heart. Her. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, you know, the dinner continues on. And O'Brien tells us that Stephen, who's really kind of a social watcher, you know, and, and a bit of a listener rather than a partaker, continues looking around the table and we're getting his impressions of the guests here. You know, he says Francis Howard of the Aurora, the best Greek scholar in the Navy is across from Thomas. And, and Stephen had really been hoping to sit next to Howard. He wanted to talk to him about all his Greek scholarship here. To Howard's right is Smith of the Camilla and then Fitton. Mm -hmm. We talked about yeah. Fitton. And, and we, I, you know, I just love how Stephen's mind wonders, like you say, you know, here's, here's his thought about how people take homosexuality. Here's his thought about looking at the people thinking, hmm, they're both roundheaded, yeah. you know, cheerful, intelligent, just like men of the Navy would never be mistaken for soldiers, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then he, you know, Stephen wonders what the phrenologist Gall would say about so many round-headed, cheerful, intelligent men showing up in the Navy here. And we'll, we'll get back to both of those, phrenology and Gaul, here in a second. And he comes to Thomas of the Thames right on Stephen's right. He says he's also round-headed, but neither young nor cheerful. And, you know, <laughs> Brian tells us a little bit more that his service nickname is the Purple Emperor, or sometimes just Emperor. He's the oldest man present, has an authoritarian face with a perpetually cross expression of disapproval. So O'Brien clearly Sweet. setting us up over and over and over again about Thomas of the Thames. Well, yeah, there's a little bit of history for us, a little bit of, shall I say, science, maybe not exactly science. Yeah. Uh, tell us about this phrenology and Gaul. <laughs> Well, phrenology was really popular in the 19th century. It's this science that involves m measuring and mapping bumps on the skull to predict mental traits. It's based on the idea that the brain is the organ of the mind and that the regions of the brain are like muscles that can be exercised and become bigger, like, like biceps, if you like. Therefore, the muscles, the organs in the brain that are used less become smaller, they atrophy. 
And this guy, Franz Josef Gaul, developed the central notion that you can measure the contour of someone's skull and predict personality traits, including criminality and a whole bunch of other things. A notion later thoroughly disproved by science, by neurology, by everything that we know about the anatomy of the skull, but a really popular idea. And all of those with round heads and bumps and ridges and weird shaped skulls can can be relieved, I think, Mike, that it doesn't say anything too damning about our personalities. Yeah, that, that whole serial killer diagnosis I got from the phrenologist, I, I'm, I'm so glad to be passed <laughs> right now. <laughs> So, and, and maybe, you know, maybe we can get out, uh, if we have time, there was a, a great 1895 Webster's Dictionary picture of, here's what all the sections of your brain are, according to phrenology, oh, you know, yeah, a great. number of which made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me, even once they were mapped. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the dinner continues, Stephen's, you know, kind of caught up in thought and looking at all these people. And Joe Place leans over to tell him that his sleeve is in his soup. Hmm. <laughs> Stephen kind of whips it out. He's trying to get it with his sleeve. It's very oily and it's not working. And Duff, very civilly, gives him a piece of bread to help him get the oil out of his jacket. Um, and as, as he does that, a veal roast loin is set before them. And Stephen offers to carve a piece for Duff. And Duff is very appreciative, says he hates carving. And then Stephen, being polite, turns to Thomas and says, can I cut one for you? He's cutting it. And Thomas remarks that he slices as trim as a surgeon. And Stephen says, well, that's no great <laughs> virtue because I am, in fact, the Commodore's surgeon. Place sort of laughs behind him, puts his glove up to muffle it here. And then the furious Thomas says, oh, indeed, I had imagined that this was a dinner for commissioned officers, for officers in command, and spoke no more the entire dinner. Ooh. Whoa. So, you know, I'm starting to wonder now if if this is going to be the happy Navy family that Jack likes mm. to have on his ship, or if we're going to see more of the Mauritius command, uh, it gets a lot more complicated with more ships and more officers here. Yeah. And back also to the social divisions that we had in the wine dark sea in the gun room of the surprise. These things are never very far away when we get captains who come together with all these different backgrounds. Well, that's a little piece of unease that we might have to come back to later. Stephen, meanwhile, compliments Sophie extremely on the dinner next morning. And I, I'm noticing here as well, Mike, that we're going into dialogue between Stephen and Sophie. We've had dialogue between Stephen and Jack. There's, there's a part of this kind of dialogue triangle that's missing, but we'll come back to that, I think. Sophie says she's really sorry that Stephen had had to sit next to Captain Thomas, who she described as that cross old stick. And she reports what she's heard from Jack, that this guy Thomas is always finding fault, thinks that spit and polish and driving people hard to shift top gallants quickly and make the brass shine is what's going to beat the heavy American and French frigates. And she reports as well that she's heard from Jack that he'd rather that the Admiral replace this Captain Thomas. And the filling in of Thomas's character continues here as well, as Stephen now goes and has a dialogue with Tom Pullings. And Pullings says, as they were driving towards Portsmouth, that Thomas shouldn't really have risen above the rank of master's mate, doesn't know what to do with authority, so he gives orders all the time to show that he does. He's perpetually feeling ill-used, staying in a rage. And Pullings compares Thomas to fathers who always flog their kids or keep them on bread and water. And this is a little bit of a reminder, Mike, I think, of some of the things that Mrs. Williams had in mind for correcting Bridget's behavior last chapter. Anyhow, Tom adds that Lord Nelson would never have done this. Lord Nelson never topped it the knob. Thomas, to his discredit, has never been in action. And he, Thomas that is, believes that anyone who's ever been in action holds it against him and laughs at him behind his back so that he can take it out on them and everyone else. I might, we've had lieutenants, I think, aboard Jack's commands before that have had this same thing of resenting the, what you might call good fortune that others have had in seeing action in the past and having had the chances of distinguishing themselves. Tom also hopes that Aubrey can get rid of Thomas, says the squadron doesn't need the first lieutenant of a royal yacht. They need a fighting captain who inspires people the way Jack did. And he goes off into a very nice familiar O'Brien trope for all of us, just the way Jack did when they defeated the Spanish 32-gun, 319-person ship with the 14-gun Sophie and 53 men. 
This is all on the occasion, of course, when Stephen remained on his own at the helm on the ship way back in Master and Commander. The Thames's gunner had told Tom that they hadn't used their allowance of practice powder in 18 months, so they've been only running the guns in and out in dumb show. They have no chance of being able to fire two broadsides in five minutes. Anything, says Tom, for pretty decks and perfect paint. And, and Mike, we've heard pullings in this role before, I think, kind of tell, telling a little bit of the uh, of the backstory and anticipating a bit like a Greek chorus, anticipating what's going to happen next. I remember when he was anticipating storms and shipwreck way back at the beginning of Desolation Island. Yeah, it, it's so true. So true. And and, and he, he certainly is anticipating perfectly here because, you know, we cut directly to Jack talking to the Admiral, asking to replace yes. Thomas and the Thames because good gunnery is so important in this squadron. Now, the Admiral hears all the evidence and says, well, sorry, I can't shift it. You know, I can't I can't move Thames and Thomas out. So Jack's going to have to work with them to make them good gunners. And besides that, you know, he's going to have several weeks before he'll be on station. The Admiral says in the text, you'll have to make do with what you possess, which upon my word is pretty handsome for a young fellow of your age. <laughs> it's nice to hear somebody referring to Jack as a young fellow here. Yeah. Besides, <laughs> the Admiral says, you know, the Duke of Clarence says that he's never seen a ship in better order. So we keep having this reference to, you know, Thomas runs something like the Royal Yacht. And I don't know, in compliment, not a compliment? What do you think? Oh, I'm, I'm sure it's meant as not a compliment. I think, I'm pretty sure it's a reference to the sort of, you know, like Tom's already said, the sort of effete, spit and polish, you know, shallow way of uh, of, of keeping a boat here. Even so, the Admiral is giving Jack the laurel to replace the Pyramus that's been taken away, and more importantly, it's given them a sailing date. Wind and weather permitting, the squadron is going to proceed to a rendezvous off the Burlings, known as Belengas, Portugal, I think on the map, off the coast northwest of Lisbon, as Tom Horn's Cannonade.net website tells us. They're going to rendezvous off these Burlings on Wednesday the 14th. And just to make Aubrey absolutely sure of his position. The Admiral comes up with the phrase that we know, the phrase that pays. There is not a moment to lose. And since the Admiral's impatient and Jack Aubrey's presumably also impatient, we're going to take a step back for a second. We're going to enjoy a short break and we'll join you in just a few minutes. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Now it's time to step away from O'Brien for a moment and give you some thoughts on the latest Nathan Peake book, Trafalgar Fog of War. Ian's been reading it, mulling over what O'Brien readers might make of it. We talked with Paul Breyers, a.k.a. Seth Hunter, and he mentioned that he hears from American readers far more often than UK readers. So let's see if we can help balance that out today. Yeah. Yeah, let's start at the beginning. Introduce us to the Nathan Peake and give us some spoiler-free overview. What's, what's this book about? Well, Mike, the book is described to us as a nautical historical adventure story. I think Paul would be okay with us calling it an adventure story. It's centered on the experiences of a fictitious hero, Nathan Peake, who has a backstory as a Navy officer, sometime uh, spy, part American, part English by heritage and by allegiance, who's clearly already been through quite a lot of Revolutionary War history in the experience that his career and that the previous books have taken into. Now, the book roams on Nathan Peake's behalf among some very real world historical characters. and We'll talk about who they are. I would also say that I'm, I'm really struck by what Paul said a couple of weeks ago, that he, he was inspired by O'Brien, but not wanting to be too much like O'Brien. And I think the book fits its billing on, on both counts. It's certainly an adventure story with solid roots in real world history and treading that fine line between O'Brien-esque inspiration, but not being a pastiche of O'Brien. And I think Paul Bryant does a great job at doing both of those. Uh, let's be honest for a second. 
Mike, it's impossible to silence the voice in your head, or at least the voice in my head, that keeps saying, oh, this bit here, this is a callback to Patrick O'Brien, or even this bit here is something that Patrick O'Brien would have handled differently. So I'll say right away now, and I'll say at the end again, if you're the kind of reader for whom that Patrick O'Brien comparison voice is harder to quell and harder to satisfy, then let's name it right now. Reading this book or any conventional nautical history fiction book is going to give you some exasperating moments. But I found some reasons to enjoy this book, reasons that go way beyond merely saying it's almost as good as Patrick O'Brien. I think Paul Bryars is onto something here. I think his story and his main character give us an experience as readers that's different from Patrick O'Brien. Let's see, Mike, if I can make sense of all of that in the rest of the conversation today. Outstanding. So if you were going to write a hook for this book, you know, that pithy phrase that realistically hooks people who would actually enjoy the book, what might it be? I think I'd say that this is a whole new way to bring a 21st century point of view and a contemporary style adventure story into an authentic 18th century context. Ooh, nice, nice. So, so what's your first take on Trafalgar? Well, it's funny. It changed as I was reading the book. In the first half of the book, I was spending a lot of time with that O'Brien brain, a little bit too switched on. So sometimes I was itching a little bit to, to, to move on or to hear a little bit more about character. But in the second half, I think two things happened. My O'Brien brain quietened down a little bit so that I could enjoy the story, which is really well told. And actually, Paul's narrative of the lead up to and the conduct of the Battle of Trafalgar were really great. I mean, I I might say breathtaking, not only because I'd wanted to read about some of this in fiction for a long time. And now that we're here, it's great. But but also that it's told from a really interesting perspective. And the, the writing of that passage alone is worth the price of admission. Makes me want to read some more of his books now, since I've learned, I think, a little to control my Patrick O'Brien critical brain. Nice, nice. Well, well, tell us a little bit more about the book. For example, did the characters, did the setting, do they feel real to you? It's funny. I think in the first half of the book, I was looking out for ways in which I thought maybe they slightly didn't. But I understood that Paul's approach to writing the characters is very different from the way that O'Brien writes a character. He's not writing to serve exploration of character and personality in the same way that O'Brien is. He's writing the characters in order to serve a story that keeps moving ahead. Mike, I actually think Nathan Peake, the character, is more like uh, somebody like Jack Reacher in the Lee Child novels. That's that's a comparison that I make as a fan of the Lee Child novels and not wanting to make anybody think this is just kind of meat-headed violence. But the Jack Reacher character is a bit more subtle than the hard-bitten interior monologue would suggest, and we get hints of that all the way through the stories. Same goes, I think, for Nathan Peake. And he does that same Jack Reacher-esque thing of moving from scene to scene, just kind of taking people and situations in his stride. And we know that we're headed somewhere, and it's part of the intrigue to think, where is it going to get us? How are we going to get to the denouement that we suspect is some way a distance off? The other interesting thing for me, Mike, about the characterization was that to an even greater extent than Patrick O'Brien, there are really strong characterizations of some real world people. As the blurb says, you're going to meet Sir Sidney Smith, he of whom Lord Clonfort was such a big fan. We're going to meet the inventor of the submarine, Robert Fulton. We're going to meet Lord Barham, First Lord of the Admiralty, and spend more time with Barham than we spend with uh, Melville or any of the other First Lords in the O'Brien canon. We're even going to meet Empress Josephine. And I've got to say, I had to suspend a little disbelief at the Empress Josephine part of the storyline, but that turned out to be not too difficult, given the other things that were happening in the story as it flowed. Oh, nice. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Well, did the story keep you guessing? Um, well, it's not structured as a whodunit. Like I said, it's more of an adventure story. There were certainly lots of how will we get to Trafalgar from here guessing going on in my head, because we know from the title of the book and you know from the blurb that that's where we're headed. There's also a romance, and not a conventionally told romance either, quite an unusual romance, and a twist at the end that had me flipping back through the pages of the book to try and spot a little bit of sleight of hand. So that's, that's where we get to, I think, in terms of keeping me guessing. So what was your favorite part of the book and why? And, and you know, as always in The Lover's Hole, you can do it in a spoiler-free way. Oh, for sure. Um, I think without doubt, as you've already heard me hint, the Trafalgar chapters 
uh, and also the Cape Finisterre action, which was really well plotted and well written, were really nice. excellent. There are occasional flashes of humor. There are, there is sardonic perspective from Nathan Peak himself that made me laugh, not belly laughs the way that I get in some of O'Brien, but a bit more easygoing and a bit more escapist in that style than some of the other more kind of po-faced writers that I've come across in the genre. Oh, nice. And and any kinds of scenes that are particularly well-written in this book? Yeah, as I say, Trafalgar and Cape Finisterre, Paul's already hinted to us that Trafalgar is told from the point of view of being aboard the Redoutable, aboard a French ship. Right. And that's right. really well written, really intense. I, I think darker and more savage in a way than some of O'Brien's action, but he's absolutely earned getting us to that point. And even though we know what the outcome is going to be, there's still lots of jeopardy for people who are involved in the story. And there's a really fascinating storyline about a Sicilian Marine that I won't say any more about, but you kind of begin to spot what this character is going to be involved in. And it gives you a bit of a smile as you see that woven into the rest of the story. Nice. Nice. It, it's probably worth saying there were some things that that I had to sort of skip past and, and not think too hard about. I, I had to skip past the Empress Josephine bit. That just took me to the bounds of my willingness to suspend disbelief. You can see exactly why she appears. And clearly this part of the history of the Revolutionary War is something that the Nathan Peake character has been involved in. Um, and if I was going to be picky i'd say sometimes those encounters with those historical figures are a little bit like bumping into them and the wax works you know you go oh yeah okay that's such and such a person and they're about to do that and we kind of see them and it's exciting to be with them um sometimes i wished i could have spent a little bit more time with them i mean so sydney smith was a really well drawn and really fun character i'd like to have spent maybe even more time with Sir sydney smith and seen him interfere even more in the world of nathan peak but nice that was my thought I'm asking myself here, was this a page turner or a read and reflect type of book? Um, More the former than the latter, I think it's absolutely written with the structure and the the enjoyment of an adventure story. But it's not a shallow story and it's not a kind of meat-headed story. There are moments when you want to flip back and try and keep track of the plotting because the plotting's quite intricate, uh, much more like a contemporary action story than like. Uh, an 18th century story. Some moments as well where I think to myself, I want to go back earlier in this series and find out a little bit more about the backstory for Nathan Peake and enjoy some of these other situations that he's clearly been in as part of the backstory that we're uh, exposed to here. Well, nice. And and, and that's kind of a lead on to, you know, I I always wonder, you know, when I'm starting a new series, do I need to start at book one or could, you know, could I pick this up and really enjoy it by itself? How, how'd you find that? Oh, I think you could pick this up and enjoy it by itself, uh, including because of the fact that you know that the Trafalgar narrative is coming, and that's enough for anybody, I think, to want to keep going with this. I am sure I would have cherished some of the backstory references even more if I'd read them firsthand, but I don't think that's enough for me to say, hold off and read the previous seven books. I would say, if you're interested in this, the Trafalgar story is enough reason to pick it up. You'll enjoy the story. You'll get into it uh, if if you come at it with the kind of mindset that I think I've come to it with. And that's probably going to motivate you to go back to the beginning of the series. And once I get a gap in my reading schedule with Patrick O'Brien, I think that's what I'm going to do. Nice. Nice. You know what? We've been we've been trying the entire time to not think about this relative to the Aubrey Matron canon. But let's be specific about that. Let's just free yeah. ourselves here. So uh-huh. any compare and contrast that comes immediately to mind? Yeah. I mean, it, like you say, Mike, I, I always can't bear to. I know that it's not fair. But it's really hard not to. So I'm thinking, first of all, what was familiar? If you're a Patrick O'Brien reader, almost everything about the way shipboard life is described, clearly coming from the same well of research and scholarship that O'Brien had. You read all of this stuff and you think, yes, he's got the language and the daily patterns and the rituals and the sailing terminology and the military hierarchy of the ship. Absolutely down. So that all feels like you're stepping back into a comfortable world, into a world that we know. That leads me to think, well, what was different compared to the Patrick O'Brien stories? I, I think almost everything about the characters, starting with why we have those characters and how they're drawn, and I think I've talked about that already. I'm going to say this with a smile on my face, and not as a criticism. The characters kind of romp through a fun, sometimes a little escapist, but often very authentically drawn version of 18th century and early 19th century Europe 
populated by some of the era's most intriguing historical personalities. And if you ever wanted to put yourself in a drawing room, uh, exchanging ironic banter with Empress Josephine of France, this is a story where you'll get to experience that. If that sounds like it's too far out for you, then maybe this isn't the book for you. But I've got to say, I enjoyed it. Nice, nice. A- anything that surprised you? Well, I mean, uh, the Battle of Cape Finisterre, I-, I knew a little bit about the fact that the battle had taken place and that it was a precursor to Trafalgar, but I'm not enough of a naval history scholar to have really studied it. And it's A, really well written, and B, a real eye-opener about just what role the battle played in the strategy leading up to Trafalgar. And it's exactly as Paul said, that you can argue that the, the narrow victory at the Battle of Cape Finisterre actually made Trafalgar possible, you might say inevitable, but actually not strictly necessary. So it hasn't got the big heroic narrative that we have for Trafalgar, certainly doesn't have the scale of action that we had at Trafalgar, but it was actually the point at which Villeneuve's hopes for drawing together a grand fleet and uh, and taking control of the English Channel, this was the moment when all that unraveled. What about the writing style? Well, Mike... Again, very, very different from the world that you and I have been spending the last 147 episodes in. Uh, It's fun. Uh, As I said, it's a little bit escapist. It's quite fast-paced. It's intelligent, but really not intellectual. I would say, imagine the screenwriting of a Guy Ritchie movie set in an authentic 18th century context, uh, set to a score of speeded up harpsichord and string quartet music, and you've got the idea. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. And of course, you know, we can't do any comparison with uh, the Patrick O'Brien novels, the Aubrey Matron canon without thinking about Aubrey and Matron. So, so how about the main character or the main characters here in Trafalgar? Oh, I, I think although the, the main character has kind of dualisms with other characters in different stages of the book, it's really clear that we've got this narrative focused on one character, which is the Nathan Peake guy. Um, he's kind of a... 18th century international man of mystery. He's mainly a naval character. As the, the the way the story has gone for the previous seven books, he has managed to find himself as also part uh, intelligence agent, part international diplomat and kind of man of mystery. More in common, therefore, with, like I said, Jack Reacher or maybe Chandler's Philip Marlowe than he has in common with Jack Aubrey. And again, I think that that's actually a good thing. I don't think I could stand spending time with somebody who was trying to be the paragon that I think we all have in our minds when we think of Jack Aubrey. Nice. Yeah, too true. Too true. It's more grown up than Hornblower, more um, easygoing and escapist than Thomas Kidd, uh, more real world encounters than almost any other nautical fiction series I can think of, including the O'Brien canon. So I enjoyed it. I'm going to go read another one. Make of that what you will. Nice. Well, thanks, Ian. So for for all of us who always enjoy just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien, you know, maybe we should consider jumping into the Nathan Peake series by author Seth Hunter. Absolutely. And Mike, let's not forget that we're hoping very soon to bring everybody a little conversation with some of the people involved in the publishing side behind this book and a whole bunch of other nautical fiction books. So we're going to be back in the world of nautical fiction publishing again sometime very soon. Oh, looking forward to that as well. Hopefully, maybe a few stories about remembering when and what's on the horizon. Yeah, definitely. Mike, thanks very much for setting that up. I really enjoyed chatting about Paul's book, really enjoyed reading Paul's book. I'll be really fascinated to hear if we've got any listeners who've had the chance to pick up a Nathan Peake book. Tell us what you thought. So, Mike, and now that we've shared our thoughts about the book review, we've heard about the world of Nathan Peake. Let's get back into the world of Jack and Stephen and see where they're up to in the second half of our chapter here. Well, you know, we heard the Admiral saying there's not a moment to lose. And, and Jack's not losing a moment. He's back on the flagship, the Bologna, and he's passing the word for Dr. Matron to tell him what he's heard. And one of the seamen uh, is explaining to a newly pressed hand as this word is kind of going down the ship that the Commodore and the doctor have been tie mates for years. And this newly pressed lubber has never heard that term. The veteran says tie mates help you delouse and comb and plait each other's pigtails in time for muster. And the new man says, well, you know, can't you do that for yourself? Just kind of, you know, reaching behind your back. And the seaman answers, not in time for muster, mate. Not in time for kingdom come, neither. 
And I, I love this line. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it means that you couldn't do it if you had all the time in the world, but I kind of took it to mean a, you know, kind of being symbolic of a lifelong friendship with somebody yeah. who literally has your back. And that, you know, that's what resonated for me. Uh, and it's a great little notice of the fact that Jack's connection with Stephen and vice versa is noticed by the shipmates and it's noticed as being enduring. And again, stick a pin in that. We might come back to some contrast, some juxtaposition with that in a, in a little while. Meanwhile, Jack, in conversation with his particular friend, Stephen, shares some more good news. This 21-gun ship, the Laurel, one of the new sixth rates, is joining the squadron. She's quick in stays. And she's commanded by their old friend, Dick Richards. Now, Stephen remembers this guy as Spotted Dick from way back when he was a midshipman in the Bodicea in the Mauritius Command. We've also seen or heard about him as a lieutenant in Desolation Island, uh, as the Apollo-like flag lieutenant of Admiral Pellew's ship Irresistible. In the reverse of the medal, he was third lieutenant for Jack and he was in the Diane on the 13-gun salute and aboard the Nutmeg in Nutmeg of Consolation. So without being quite at the level of Babington or Mowat, he's turned into a bit of an important secondary character as our friend Richard's here. And it's interesting that Stephen's memory goes back to this naming of him as Spotted Dick to his acne because Stephen's greatest point of recall might be what he's treated the men for rather than their conduct as, uh, as sea officers, which is an interesting different perspective here. Jack's excited because he remembers teaching Richard's gunnery and Richard's gun crews were always the best. So this is a nice contrast to the reservations that he's got about Captain Thomas and his gunnery. Um, he's also excited because of this sailing date. He says he's really glad not to be one of those many Commodores who are delayed in port until the whole scheme is given up. And as he says, the Commodore sent back among the mere post captains and reduced to begging in the street, having spent his last guineas on a rear admiral's gold lace. <laughs> we we have this great moment then in this conversation where Jack and Stephen seem to switch roles just a little bit. At, at least they're kind of uh, they're top of mind intelligence thinking here. Yeah. Stephen says, well, you know, well, what's the date? When are we going to sail? And Jack replies, Stephen, do not be indiscreet, I beg. French spies may see all the bustle and, and it's reported by the countless smugglers. But so long as no one ever mentions the actual date, the ministry feels that's quite safe. All I can say is there's not a moment to be lost. You must attend to your medical stores directly and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. So I think Jack poking the Admiralty in the eye and some of the intelligence, uh, uh, you know, look, they're going to see us ramping up our things. But as long as nobody ever says the actual date, they won't know we're leaving. (laughs) Good fun. It is good fun. And, and and Jack's very canny, I think, in his knowledge of what has to be done to get this squadron out to sea. Stephen is really under pressure then to get the medical side of things organized aboard the Bellona. He's working with his assistants, who, and uh, Mike, I'm getting the impression here that everything is kind of all copacetic again after he had his moment of outrage about the sick bay in the previous chapter. He's getting all of his medical supplies in order. There are several things that he's ordered personally, a particularly fetid asafetida, that is to say this very uh, stinky gum, very pungent spice that's used in uh, Indian cooking. And we've heard him talk about this before. He likes to use it as an odorizing agent so that people really know they've been dosed. Anyhow, he's got the asafetida. He's got his portable soup, he, which he describes as infinitely superior to the victualling board second-hand carpenter's glue. And, and he describes a substance that's more valuable, more valuable than asafetida, more valuable than bark, than quicksilver or opium. He's talking about coca leaves. And he's already been trying to push his coca leaf habit off onto Sir Joseph in the last chapter or two. He tells his assistants that they're great for melancholia, for morbid depression, whether rational or irrational, and for restless uneasiness of the mind that's so often part of a fever. He says that coca creates opium's lucid sense of well-being without addiction. Yeah, right. It doesn't help people sleep like opium does, but with coca leaf, you don't need to sleep. Smith asks if it's dangerous in any way. Yeah, just like all the rest of us are asking here, Stephen. And Stephen says, no, people throughout Peru use it all the time. He's sure, he says, that with man being man, someone could abuse it, just like people abuse coffee and tea and wine and spirits. But he had never heard of that in Peru. 
And he says how he's been able to work through the night without exhaustion or weariness. He's hoping to test it on melancholy subjects aboard the Surprise. But all the people there were routinely cheerful. And he's rather disappointed to learn that there are no cases of melancholia aboard the Bellona either. So, Mike, you've got to wonder here, who is Stephen kidding? What, what, what about the rats? What about you yourself, Stephen? Yeah, really, <laughs> only too true. Well, Jack comes in and, of course, goes overboard admiring the new sick berth. Oh, Stephen, you're so light, so airy, so wonderful, right? And tells Stephen that a man from the sick and hurt board is here to see Stephen in the cabin. Stephen goes back up. The gentleman and Stephen never let on that they know each other, even though the text tells us this is one of Sir Joseph's seldom seen officials from naval intelligence who's often entrusted with the most delicate missions. The sick and hurt papers he delivers to Stephen and their administrative discussions are all covers for a secret note that Sir Joseph has slipped in to these papers, asking Stephen to meet him in what he calls the Beetlewood that afternoon. <laughs> so Stephen heads to this rendezvous in the Beetlewood, and this Beetlewood is said to be the home of a couple specific beetles, which we'll come back to here. It's near Sir Joseph's farm, which is happens to be not far past Ashgrove here. I couldn't help but wondering, Ian, why, you know, why we name just a couple of specific beetles here? Any, any thoughts? Well, we've got this name for beetles, uh, the Calisoma sycophanta, and also some tiger beetles. And you can dig into this and find out a little bit more about these species. Calisoma sycophanta is a small ground beetle with iridescent metallic colors. And we've already seen that. O'Brien loves his color. We were talking about the color of coats earlier on. Now we've got the color of beetles. Green, blue, bronze, copper, gold, and black, all changing according to the direction and the quality of the light. These calisoma beetles are a voracious eater of caterpillars, and we can share on our socials a video of a caterpillar coming to a sticky end at the hand of a calisoma sycophanta. And the other beetles that get mentioned here, tiger beetles, are known for having aggressive predatory habits, having a really fast running speed, 125 body lengths per second, which is considerably more than I can manage these days. And it seems like maybe we're getting a little signal from O'Brien about something dangerous and predatory, despite its shiny colours and its outward appearance. Sir Joseph reports that the exceptionally revengeful Hobbockstall has now identified Stephen as the destroyer of his friends Ledward and Ray, and Clarissa as the source of you know the the Admiralty or particularly Sir Joseph and Sir Joseph's information about the Duke here. So the criminals who engineered the stock exchange fraud against Captain Aubrey and arranged the murder and disfigurement of the witness who might have cleared Jack. Pratt tells him now that Hobbickstall's attorneys have gotten in touch with some of these same people. And Stephen says, well, Sir Joseph, you know, I've, I've actually also hired Pratt on a family matter here. And so they're, they're c- comparing notes on Pratt. And then Sir Joseph tells Stephen, these men have discovered that Stephen has illegally brought two unpardoned convicts back from New South Wales, that being Padeen and Clarissa, and that he's asked Sir Joseph to obtain a pardon for them. However, Sir Joseph says, since that pardon has not yet been obtained, Stephen is open to a charge that could lead to death, perhaps, but certainly to imprisonment and loss of all his property. And they also say that the pardon that Sir Joseph got for Stephen years ago, and at this point, Stephen says, what, wait, what do you mean, pardon you got from me years ago? (laughs) And Sir Joseph says, oh, yeah, that. Well, when the department first asked for Stephen's advice on Catalan affairs, they realized that he and some of his friends and relations were connected to the Irish Rising of 1798. Ah, and that without making Stephen part of a fuller general pardon that was being put together at the time, Sir Joseph could not have shown Stephen confidential documents without committing a crime, and not doing so would have left Stephen open to malignant private persecution at any time, robbing the department of his invaluable help. So they had put Stephen in this big general pardon of people connected to the Rising. However, these people have found that that pardon may not be completely watertight if new evidence against Stephen can be obtained he could actually be taken up for treason. 
and that there are people, he says, like Sir, S-I-R-R, in Dublin who could be procured mm. for not much price to provide evidence against Stephen, who could be bought off here. And, you know, it's funny, this major Sir, S-I-R-R, Stephen had mentioned him with contempt in Master and Commander, yeah. an actual historical person. Henry Charles Sir was an Irishman in the British Army for many years before becoming the chief of Dublin police in 1796. And during the rising a couple of years later, he became the primary source of English intelligence on the United Irishman. Matter of fact, he personally led the party that captured Lord Edward Fitzgerald. We remember Stephen, you know, talking about him so much in Master and Commander. And he was the guy who fatally wounded Fitzgerald uh, in the struggle to, to capture him there. All that thanks to the Patrick O'Brien muster book. So great source. Yeah. I might, it's it's a, another bit of a role reversal here. It's it's normally Jack who is the one who discovers that he's wanted on shore for some kind of trumped up charge. But now it's Stephen. And we, we've never been in this situation before. Stephen's going to have to flee from criminal charges here, even though they've been brought up by these people who are engaged in spying against him. Now, Sir Joseph is on hand here still. He pulls out a handkerchief and from his pocket falls a crumpled envelope. It's Stephen's statement for the hire of the surprise for the South American mission. And uh, we get this little funny interlude here that the accountant has been auditing Stephen's statement here. And he discovers a couple of things. Uh, first of all, on the first page, he's 18 pence out in the things that he's claiming. And also, on a slightly different scale, Stephen had forgotten to add the agreed line of £17,000 for hire, maintenance and repairs to the surprise. And Stephen says, with a little bit of self-knowledge here, how life is diminished when you can forget or indeed even dismiss £17,000. And very true. Life is diminished indeed. Meanwhile, back to this story about the criminal gang and Habak's Tal. Habak's Tal hasn't had the information yet from the gang. They want to make him pay dearly for it and then blackmail him for having procured and used them. They intend to blackmail Stephen too, since he's known to be wealthy, and at the moment, very vulnerable over Padine and Clarissa, and the possibility that they might be returned to New South Wales. Now, Sir Joseph has learned this from some more of our old friendly secondary characters, from Pratt and from Lawrence, who is the attorney back in the stock exchange case. Now, Habax Tal's got his own issue with his own lawyers, but we understand that Lawrence has found that there are long delays in granting these routine pardons for Clarissa and Padding, and this is all part of a maneuver against Blaine. So for the time being, Stephen's going to have to take the utmost care. Well, Stephen says how much he esteems and likes Lawrence and asks if Lawrence had any advice for him. And Blaine says, yeah, actually, his advice was exactly the same as Pratt's. You know, Pratt had, had come to Blaine on Monday and said that a low attorney is going to have the papers on Clarissa from Newgate Prison uh, proving her transportation. So, you know, both Lawrence and Pratt, very concerned. The evidence is rolling in. It's imminent, about to be delivered. And Blaine says he actually agrees, and he would offer the same advice as the two of them. They all think Stephen should escape with Padin and Clarissa and all of his money that he can lay hands on, since once the charges are filed, Stephen's account at his banking house will be attached, and he won't be able to touch it. So his funds will be locked down until the end of you know the outcome of the trial that will ensue. So. Blaine is telling him, along with Pratt and Lawrence, he needs to stay hidden at least until the Duke of Sussex returns, and that Blaine is going to be in a stronger position. He can get Clarissa and Padine's pardons, and once he gets those pardons, Stephen's kind of in the clear, and he reminds Stephen that the Duke of Sussex outweighs the Dutch Duke, you know, Havokstal. So once the Duke is back from Portugal, we're in the clear, but until then, you know, you need to get the heck out of town. Wow. Again, roles reversed. This is Stephen in a Jack Aubrey kind of a situation. Now, Blaine points out that the whole thing hinges on Habakstal. If he were eliminated, he could do no favours and all this reluctance about pardons would vanish. And the moment they're granted, the blackmailers have no hold on you whatsoever. He fell silent, but his look conveyed all he meant it to convey. 
So, Mike, it seems like Sir Joseph here is hinting, suggesting, maybe even encouraging Stephen to kill or to commission the killing of the Duke of Habakstar. Certainly, says Stephen in reply. He is as much the enemy as Ledward was, and Ray, and some other men I have killed or caused to be killed with a tranquil conscience. But here the case is altered. And with my commitments in this country, I do not think I can consider such a course. Blaine says he understands the position, but regrets it, because if Habakstal were dead, all his revenge and influence die with him, and the court case, a private prosecution, also dies with him. They wouldn't have to wait for the Duke of Sussex to return or try to turn to Prince William for help. And, says Sir Joseph, the department would be rid of a dangerous opponent for good and all. Well, Blaine says that Lawrence had told him that he thought Stephen had a great deal of fortune in gold, that is to say, not tied up in a bank account. Stephen says, this is true. It's in the chests that he inherited in a vault. And Blaine asks if Stephen's willing to sign a letter of attorney so that he, Blaine Lawrence, can go and have it moved out of the bank to somewhere safer. Stephen says he would. Uh, and Mike, I hesitate at this point because I remember Stephen's form with signing documents in front of and with the connivance of Sir Joseph Blaine, right? So I hope that he's going to spell his name correctly, that he's going to put the date on the top, that he's not going to forget and refer to... Oh, never mind. Anyway, Stephen says that he would write such a letter of, uh, of attorney. And Blaine is pleased by this. He says, we both thought so. And Lawrence prepared the paper. Here is a pocket ink horn and a pen. The bank will need some little time to get everything ready. And you know, there is not a moment to lose. End of chapter four. So Mike, besides ending on our favorite stock phrase here, there's been quite a lot going on in this chapter, right? There really has. I mean, and, and, and clearly there are this theme of not a moment to lose. Faster, 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 more and more and more happening. Just as the squadron's getting ready to sail, it seems like things that, you know, I would say over here, gone south. I don't know, your side of the Atlantic, maybe pear-shaped. But uh, with not a moment to lose, everything is a little bit topsy-turvy here. And we're kind of thinking, what can Stephen do? I mean, I understand him not wanting to kill or have killed a semi-royal but yeah. but what's his alternative? You know, does he run away with Clarissa and Padine? You know, can they find three bear suits somewhere and and someone who will lead them <laughs> to his old home place? I don't know. What do you what do you do in a situation like this? Well, uh, Stephen's got some big problems, and like we say, these are typically problems that have beset Jack. But now Stephen's really going to have to think about this. Jack's own problems are smaller, but clearly they exist in the person of this diverse group of captains that he's got to try and command. We've got Captain Thomas and his poor gunnery and his potential ill will towards other members of the squadron. We've got perhaps the, the, the risk that the, the, the squadron could be degraded altogether. This all may be a problem if they get launched. It may be a problem if they encounter certain kinds of enemies above, over and above the more kind of easily, uh, easily overcome enemies. Will Jack then have to leave without Stephen? And Jack, in senior command, with the rank of Commodore, with a secret intelligence mission he doesn't know about yet, and having to do all this without Stephen? Doesn't sound great, does it, Mike? No, no, I don't like that at all. You know, it's it's a very small chapter, but a very consequential one. And it's one of those times where, again, I can't wait to turn the page and find out what happens next. Wow. Mike, in that case, what do you say next week? to another, perhaps even more consequential chapter of Patrick O'Brien. I would like that of all things. driving towards Portsmouth that Thomas shouldn't really have ridden no 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 I'll put my teeth in that Thomas oh. shouldn't really have risen above the rank of master's mate